right, so we together are going to be talking a little bit about limits. So the concept of limits are there are uh, processes in mathematics and physics and engineering and all that which sort of the normal rules of arithmetic and algebra and stuff aren't necessarily going to work for. And we need something new, some other way to talk about uh, where things go, how things move. A lot of this has to do with things that are moving and changing. So a quick example is let's say we write down the function f at x is equal to 1 over x. So what does this look like? Well, this, the graph of this guy here, let's just graph it for some positive values. We can see, and you can plug in some numbers, you can see how this works and just uh, uh, sort of do this yourself with your own sort of numerical investigations, that of course as x becomes very large, let's just add in this is our x and this is our y as usual, as x becomes very large, 1 over x becomes very small. So small in fact that it really starts to hug this x-axis and we really uh, often would like to call something like this uh, a horizontal asymptote. We know that this function value gets very very close arbitrarily close to zero as it goes out. But of course, one over a positive number is never going to be zero exactly. So it doesn't ever hit zero, but it nonetheless gets closer and closer. So in this case, we'd like to say something like the limit as x goes to infinity all the way out this way, as you go, it's going to get closer and closer to zero. So this is the statement that 1 over x has a horizontal asymptote at 0, okay? Relatedly, we see that we have a vertical asymptote here. As you go closer and closer to 0 from the right, this graph almost becomes vertical. So we sort of want to say that this function blows up or goes to infinity. So one thing that we might want to say is that the limit as x goes to 0 from the right, that's what this symbol means, of 1 over x, is equal to infinity. And indeed, that's another of the things that we're going to say. We're going to be able to talk about what this rigorously means a little bit more, and notably how to compute these sorts of limits soon. So that's sort of one of the aspects that we want to cover, what these things mean, and how if you get maybe a function that's a little more complicated than just this, how to deal with it. But there are definitely all sorts of other limiting processes, and uh, if you want to talk about calculus or really higher math in general, you need some sort of knowledge of how these things work. So here are a couple of places where limits come up. So the first relates to differential calculus, which we're not going to be talking about uh, just yet. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about limits uh, for now, but just to get a picture in your head. The whole idea behind differential calculus is suppose you have a graph like this and we'd like to know what say at a given point, let's say this point here, what the tangent line is to this graph. This is probably a picture with which you're familiar. We sort of want to pick out exactly the right way to pinpoint what line hugs this curve very nicely. And how do we do such a thing? Well, what we could do is we could try to approximate it in the following way. One thing that we could do is, and this is something that uh, deserves more time to uh, uh, handle fully, but basically we end up thinking of the slope of this line as something like a speed of this curve, the instantaneous rate that it's changing. And how you can approximate something like this is with an average rate of change. If I took some other little point, let's say c plus h over here, I could approximate the average rate of change of this function on this little interval as the slope of this line here that goes between these two points. And the idea is, and what one sees in the differential part of calculus, is as h gets smaller and smaller from either side, this, we call this a secant line approximation, gets closer and closer to spitting out this line here. And this process of h getting smaller and smaller and sort of converging, if you will, to something is exactly a limiting process. 
So basically, how we are going to define the derivative when you get there in your calculus classes is you're going to need to limit h going to zero. So this is another example of a limiting process, and it's necessary to talk about instantaneous velocity, which if you think of this graph as a position function, the slope of this line is indeed its instantaneous velocity at a point. So another related limiting process is the limit of sequences. Say you have a bunch of numbers, let's call them a1, a2, a3, etc. And you want to sort of say somewhere that these numbers go to. Eventually, as n becomes very large, they're going to hit some point, if you will. So as a quick example, if your sequence a n is 1 over n, that is to say what the sequence is, is it's just sort of these points at 1, and 2, and 3, and 4, and so on, on this function, you might expect that these guys are going to get very small and are going to go to zero, because what's happening is as you plug huge numbers into little n, 1 over little n is going to become very small, and it's going to go to zero. So a different type of limiting process than we're going to talk about but nonetheless, one that is there, and you'll probably eventually see, is that in this case, the limit as n goes to infinity of a n is going to be zero. But there are cooler things that we can do with this as well. You might have heard of the Fibonacci sequence, so defined in the sense that f of n plus 2 is equal to f of n plus 1 plus f of n, where we start off with f of 0 is equal to f of 1 is equal to 1. And we can get the Fibonacci numbers from this. Sort of a fun limit that we like to be able to compute is the fact that as it turns out, the limit of the ratios of these guys, so the limit as n goes to infinity, of the n plus first divided by the nth Fibonacci number is actually what's called the golden ratio, 1 plus root 5 over 2. Okay, So a, th a third limiting process which comes up in calculus is the concept of the integral finding an area under a curve. So if you have some curve, let's say like this, you might want to find the area under it between a and b. So how would you do such a thing? Well, one way is you can approximate it. We know how to compute the area of rectangles, so I can, say, break this interval in half, take this rectangle that lies under the curve, and this rectangle that lies under the curve, and I can say, okay, the area under this curvy line is at least the area of the sum of these two rectangles. But I can take this further. Of course, I'd have a better approximation if I broke the interval into even two more pieces. If I broke it into two more pieces, I'd then get slightly better rectangles. This one would be a little taller. Maybe this one wouldn't. But nonetheless, as we get as we break the line up more and more, we can in principle get better and better approximations and get closer and closer to the area under our curve. We can indeed take a limit of this process to get the area under the curve exactly. So. What we're going to be talking about together is mostly these types of limits here, and as well as at finite, uh, uh, other finite numbers other than zero. We're mostly just going to be talking about these and how to compute them. But nonetheless, the point I wanted to make here is that the notion of limits underpins all of calculus, and you need to really get it down in order to go any further. So we'll be talking about limits.